Hello and welcome to another episode of the CG Garage. This is episode number 275 featuring Jody Madden, CEO of Foundry, an amazing company that creates uh, great software such as Nuke, Katana, uh, Mari, Moto, uh, really great stuff that is coming out of uh, there. Obviously, Nuke is something I'm very familiar with. Uh, they came originally from Digital Domain, which is where I originally met Jody. Uh, she and I were both uh, at Digital Domain around the same time. Of course, I was not uh, management as she is, but <laughs> I was just a, a lowly artist over there. But I've always been impressed with her. She is very, very inspirational, uh, excellent communicator, and uh, really, uh, really inspiring. Don't you? Didn't you find her inspiring, Kristen? No. Oh, yeah, her. From being 21 years old, uh, just coming out of college, to be, uh, as and then she was a leader at ILM at 21. Yeah. Um, and she kind of talks about you asked her like, was she intimidated? And she said kind of the lack of fear and her youth, just not knowing anything, kind of made her career skyrocket. And she yeah. became her leadership style is awesome. Kind of how you talked about it, even at Digital Domain, she kind of like sits with people and connects. Mm -hmm. um, and that was amazing to hear about. Yeah, she's really, really cool. And I really appreciate all the stuff that she's done. Uh, and in terms of some of the things that are going on in the company, we also talked quite a bit about uh, our current situation uh, in terms of obviously, you know, our, our forced isolation situation and how we're all working from home and how that's going to be uh, changing the way that people work and the, the way that people interact with their software. And I thought that was a pretty good conversation too that we had, right? Mm -hmm. We yeah, all, that was really interesting. Yeah, we can all learn from that. Um, and uh, there's some really, some really good stuff that was going on. Uh, I really liked it. Uh, this is a, a test again. We are trying to do our video podcast. We are still learning, so stick with us. Uh, Jody's video, unfortunately, was going out a few times, especially at the beginning, was going out quite a bit. So uh, her video was going out, but towards the end, she's pretty much, uh, all of her video was fine. So if you're watching it on video, please uh, forgive our dust as we're figuring out how to uh, make these video things work. But I, it's fun. You guys seem to be liking it. So we're, we're keeping up with the videos, right? Kristen and I are putting on our best face and I'm putting on a nice <laughs> fish shirt today. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, let's see. Uh, we've got some announcements. What are some of our announcements, Kristen? All right. So V-Ray 5 for 3 Days 3D's Max Beta is now available. It came out, we did that last week. Mm -hmm. um, and you can find this out at chaosgroup.com, all the information to try it out. That's right. So if you guys are V-Ray users and you'd like to try it a beta, you should do that. This is V-Ray 5. This is a major release. There's a huge amount of things that are going on to V-Ray 5. So you guys should totally check it out. I am in the middle of writing some blog posts about it. I'm writing one about the new light mix feature of the new frame buffer. Uh, very Sounds very specific, but it's really incredible. Uh, lots of cool stuff. So lots of things to check out. Go check it out. V-Ray 5 for 3DS Max, uh, available now for in beta to, to, to try out. And all the other platforms will be coming soon. So don't ask, well, where is it for Maya? Where is it for this? It's coming. Don't worry. It's coming. Uh, so we're excited about that. And then uh, what other announcements we have? Um, the Education Collection, which mm -hmm. we've been talking about, that is out and it's 150 a year. Um, and this includes all our V-Ray products, except for Katana and Nuke. Um, but Phoenix and Vermaya and Max are also included in the collection. That's right. Uh, so, the, and uh, I'm also gonna, I'm just going to bundle in the other thing we also talked about, which is the PLE version. So the education version is available for anyone who is in school or currently teaching or anyone in the academic world. Uh, $150 a year gets you all of the V-Ray, all the Chaos Group products, uh, V-Ray and Phoenix, et cetera. Uh, with the only two exceptions being V-Ray for Nuke and V-Ray for Katana. And uh, those are, there's some complications behind why that's the case. But just uh, stick with us. You get all the other ones, um, including Moto and uh, Houdini and all, this, all the Phoenixes. Uh, but the PLE version is for anyone. Anyone who wants to try out V-Ray for Maya, uh, you can do it, and it is free. Uh, there are some restrictions because it is a PLE version, which is the Personal Learning Edition. Uh, so there's stuff going on there. And this kind of relates back to what we had talked about with uh, with Jody about companies giving out software for people to educate themselves uh, and learn more about the software and the difference between 
commercial software and proprietary software because obviously uh, products like Nuke was proprietary and became you know, uh, commercial. So it's very interesting to have that whole conversation about that stuff. Um, okay, and I think that's it for our announcements, right? Yep. Okay, great. Yep. So, uh, yeah. So if you guys uh, do enjoy this podcast in YouTube form, make sure and subscribe to us. Sean will be taking care of us in on the YouTube side of things and making sure it's all going up there. But give us, uh, you know, let us know in the comment section what you think, if you have any ideas, if you want to help us out, if you want to have say, hey, you know, Chris, next time you should do this. Or Kristen, how about you bring in this guest? I have some ideas. We've got some very good guests coming up. So you, know, you should be excited about that. Um, and uh, not all of our podcasts will be video, but we're going to try to make the most, most as many as we can um, coming up. So that will be cool. And if you want to learn more about the podcast in general, where can you go? You can go to facebook.com slash CG Garage Podcast or chaosgroup.com slash CG Garage. Perfect. And if you have any other ideas or comments or anything, just go to labs at chaosgroup.com. Email us there. Uh, again, that's labs at chaosgroup.com and let us know what your ideas and thoughts are. Uh, and of course, if you have, uh, we'd always appreciate a rating on Apple Podcast uh, as well. That's always welcome. All right. That being said, please enjoy this incredible podcast with Miss Jody Madden. Welcome to another CG Garage where the Chaos Group talks. You'll know it's over when the last bucket drops. We're gonna fire off rays in high dynamic range. We know that ambient occlusion is passe. Global illumination won't lead you astray. And while image-based lighting is really swell, you need to make sure everything has for now. You've listened to some of these podcasts. You said you listened to the one with Vicky, right? I have, yeah. I listened to the one with Vicky, and then, of course, I listened to the one, um, the Magnopus Takeover with Sally and team. That was good. You were that, you were definitely outnumbered. <laughs> yes. No, there's uh, – in fact, I am wearing a Sally Slade T-shirt today. I love that. Which That's is, uh, good. It says 300 rows on it, which was the la – we were celebrating when we were leaving the, the old facility sort of – commemorating that that day but uh it was uh it's, i figured it's like oh this would be a good shirt to wear today that's a good one <laughs> i like it yeah yeah it was a good that was a good podcast uh sally is a very very bright girl and uh i and i've known her for a long time and uh, uh her and kat and emily were phenomenal on that episode i loved yeah that was I, great yeah yeah, I re I just actually uh, uh, sent them a, a a video about how to play Dungeon and Dragons online. Now that you, it's the same nice. situation, <laughs> you know? exactly. So uh, anyway, we're doing that, but I don't want to get too much into that. I want to get into yeah. to you. So let, so I've I mean, obviously, I met you over at Digital Domain when you you and I were mm -hmm. both there. It was my second tour of duty at Digital Domain. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but you have a very very interesting background and i was always fascinated uh by your your leisure, leadership style at digital domain i was very very impressed by it and so i always sort Thank of want to know more about about you and this is a great opportunity to let people know about it so all i know is that it started at stanford but did it start before that <laughs> no you know stanford's a good starting point gosh it's um yeah it's hard to believe that i graduated more than 20 years ago now um but yes it, it it started at Stanford, um, grew up in California on the Central Coast, went north for school. Um, and of course, at that time, mid late 90s, um, everyone coming out of Stanford was focused on the internet boom. You know, it was the first, the early employees at Google, um, the guys at Yahoo had come out of the dorm. Yep. Um, and, you know, not unlike some of the stories Vicky told on going some of those interviews, I met with people and the fit just didn't seem right, you know, and my background was not in engineering and it certainly wasn't in art either. I was an English lit and communication background. So I studied social science. Okay. Um, and when I got out of school, I knew I wanted to stay in the Bay Area. And it was around that time, actually, that um, Lucas had announced uh, the building of the Lucas Digital Art Center um, mm -hmm. and that they had gotten approval to build their the studio um, at the Presidio. And at that point in time, I thought, gosh, what what an incredible place with an in 
fascinating mix of talent, you know, and this intersection between technology and art was always something that was fascinating to me. Right. Um, so ended up um, thinking about grad school for a bit, decided against it, realized I would be a terrible teacher uh, and sent in an application for a PA job. Um, okay. Of course, got turned down, you know, got the usual, sorry, you're not qualified to do this. And then okay. you go back wondering, how do I become qualified to become a PA? Yep. Um, but ended up actually getting called back uh, for a job that I didn't know what it was at the time. It was a digital resource coordinator job. And in fact, it was about um, working with the internal teams that were managing all the digital resources for ILM at the time. So everything from disk space to all of the O2s that were on uh, artist desks to the render servers at the big old origins back in those days, two decades ago. Yeah. Um, and that was, that was my first job. Wow. But that's a, that's a lot of technology to throw at you all at once, isn't it? It was, it really was. And that wasn't, um, it was fascinating though. And I think seeing what it took um, to produce at that point in time, visual effects for film and commercials 20 years ago um, right. and the dependency on technology um, and the intersection with the creative teams was fascinating to me, you know, and the, the groups of people continually pushing the boundaries, all the things that teams, you know, take for granted now, you know, basic, like not having, enough disk space for a single shot and having to spill disks and write things out to tape. And uh, yeah, it was, um, it, it was great to see how far the teams could push um, the technology that we did have both hardware and software. Right. Yeah. But so what was your feeling about going into all this technology? Was it something that you thought about like, Oh yeah, I really want to get involved in how to get all this, this tech to work. And you know, that's a lot of stuff to deal with. Right. It was. I think it was actually, it was how that came together in service of the creative and the intersection with that and the business um, and how those things all aligned. And I think from even an operational perspective, how you dealt with competition for all of those resources um, mm -hmm. and what that meant over time and how it was managed across teams, both from the early stages of bidding all the way through delivery. Those were fascinating problems to me. Um, and I was given the first opportunity I had at managing a team um, about nine months later, you know, and to your earlier question about leadership, um, managing a team was never something that was a goal for me at all. Um, and in fact, um, I think my immediate response when asked uh, to do it was I wasn't interested. I was quite happy alone in the corner doing my job. Um, <laughs> that didn't last for very long, though, um, right. and ended up enjoying it quite a lot. Yeah, it's funny. I think there's some people who don't, who are reluctant to, to be leaders. And then there's some people who mm -hmm. are sort of uh, want to be leaders. But I think the people who are reluctant sometimes realize that they have a skill set that they didn't you didn't realize. And the thing that I think is was really good about some of the leadership skills that I saw in you is that you went in there mm -hmm. with the idea of the team working, not you mm -hmm. working, right? <laughs> and so when the Absolutely. team does really good things, then you get excited about it because you've made a really great team. So I think that's a difference and that's probably it makes sense that you were reluctant to be a team leader because I don't mm -hmm. think that wasn't like I want to be a leader. You know, it was like, nope, you want to make a team and it was fun doing that. <laughs> Exactly. And I think that was, you know, I was fortunate to um, be given that opportunity at, you know, all of 21, I think at the time and wow, to, to <laughs> see how fulfilling that was, you know, and it yeah. really, exactly as you said, it was about enabling other people um, and enabling people to do what they're great at. And it had nothing to do with what I could produce myself. Um, and that was, I think, probably one of the most important lessons in any sort of management or leadership role. It really was about removing blockers for the team and ensuring they had everything they needed to be successful. Um, and I think in some ways, because I was fortunate enough to then um, in following roles, have the opportunity to work with engineers, truly people whose jobs I had never done myself and mm -hmm. wouldn't have the capability to do. Um, it, it forced me in many ways to focus on the connections, figuring out how to accelerate their work, figuring out how to better align them with what we were trying to achieve as a business. Right. Um, because I couldn't, I couldn't get into the code. I couldn't, um, debate with them how a rack was going to be built in a data center. Right, right, right. Um, so it was really ensuring that um, 
their strengths could shine and that they could really add value um, in, in the most important way possible. So I think being positioned in a role um, where you can't do a job yourself, um, it sets you down a path in an interesting way to approach it. But yeah, that's that's really been the common thread in, gosh, the eight roles I had there at ILM and Lucasfilm, right. all of my roles at Digital Domain, and really what led me back um, to management at Foundry. Yeah, but let's also, you know, you said you're you're 21 years old, you're a woman mm -hmm. in the tech industry, and you're going into a leadership position. That must there, there must have been some challenges in that in that position as a, as a young woman. There were, I think, also at that age, though, it, it's the lack of experience to know any better. <laughs> Perhaps uh, <laughs> there would have been more fear had I been um, had a, had a bit more years behind me. OK, um, you know, I think the, the benefit of youth. Um, and perhaps lack of fear at that point, because everything is so new. Um, right. And I think one of the most amazing things, and you know, I know you hear this all the time um, yeah. in your interviews, the willingness of people to share knowledge in this industry um, is truly exceptional, you know, yes. and people that are the best at what they do, um, their willingness to share knowledge and their patience and willingness to share with a 21 year old kid in a job maybe she shouldn't have even been in was really exceptional. Right. Um, and that, you know, I feel lucky to have been a part of that everywhere that I've worked. Um, and now partners, customers, um, our team, that's really, it's an exception that you don't see that. Um, and I think in general, approaching a situation or a team with the attitude that you are there to support, enable them, um, I think that's a much easier approach than if it were about me. Um, and I think, you know, what you were highlighting before about some leaders wanting, whether it's the spotlight or um, the focus to be on them and what they're contributing, mm -hmm. that's just, that's never been my approach. Um, yeah. And nothing I would be comfortable doing anyway. You know, I've been lucky enough to work with people that can create things that I could never have the capacity to create on my own. And so to have a part in supporting that, enabling that, ensuring they have what they need to be successful and getting things out of their way, that's the most satisfying thing I could be doing. Well, it sounds, you know, based on what you were saying that people are willing to share a lot of knowledge, it sounds to me mm -hmm. like you're basically asking more questions than look, than getting, giving answers, <laughs> which is Absolutely. a good thing, <laughs> you know? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Um, and I guess that's true. You're right. If you if you trust your team, then you're basically going to rely on them to give you answers rather than you giving them the answers they need to hear. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in those intersections as well. You know, I think um, we have such incredible experts in particular areas, whether that's deep creative tech expertise, deep technical expertise, people that are running businesses. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of times people have. Um, by definition in their roles, spend a lot of time in their functional area. And I right. was always fascinated by the intersections of those and how they came together. And I think when I look back on the opportunities that I was given, the vast majority of the roles didn't exist in their current form before I stepped into them. You know, They were born out of business need at a particular per point in time or growth in an organization or across organizations. And so, um, getting to focus in on what a team needs at that particular moment um, to be best connected to the others that are going to help make the larger group succeed, um, I, I think was a great place for me to focus my energy and right. incredibly fulfilling. Well, it sounds like you really found your voice and the way that you want to be able to uh, find your leadership and style uh, over at, uh, at Lucasfilm. And uh, that's great. Uh, how did that lead you to Digital Domain? That um, my last roles at um, Lucasfilm at the time was with the Systems Operations Engineering Group, mm -hmm. um, and they were they were incredible. During those years, they you know building Lucas Digital Art Center, the consolidation of the technology across the Lucas companies, the opening of the animation studio in Singapore. So there was a lot consolidated in those last <laughs> few years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know at that point in time, um, the CTO, VP of production and visual effects supervisor. So Kim Library, Cliff Plumer, Mark Miller, when they left um, Lucasfilm to go to Digital Domain, 
um, mm -hmm. was curious to see what challenges they were taking on. You know, being in the Bay Area, um, we were always one step removed from uh, the industry in LA and I was curious. And so mm -hmm. about a year later, um, went down to visit um, similar problems of scaling the organization. Yep. Lots of work had been taking on, um, as you know, um, and it was, it had always been a successful team at DD because of the talent there, you know, right. and I think is, is you know, the, the teams um, were exceptional at pulling together and had history to do incredible work. But a lot of the support structure to continue scaling that wasn't in place at the time. Um, and it seemed like something that I could help with. Um, so made the decision to leave the Bay Area. And so in 2007, uh, moved down to DD. Yeah. So right around the time Benjamin Button was going on yep. pre Tron, um, mm -hmm. that that group of shows. So it was it was after, you know, almost eight years in the Bay Area and got to see so much, but it seemed like a new challenge. Yeah. Well, it was definitely a really, uh, really interesting to me. Obviously, you know, I, 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 as I mentioned, I've been to DD a couple of times. So the first time I was there mm -hmm. was still during the Scott Ross days. And then I went back mm -hmm. during the second version uh, and was there during the transition to the third one, third version <laughs> of DD, uh, which you were a part of that. Uh, and, you know, that was an extraordinary challenge uh, for that company. Mm -hmm. Uh, and mm -hmm. for you guys as management, uh, and sitting Absolutely. here as an observer, I was, I mean, I think you remember, uh, what was so incredible to me was the fact that you guys would hold, had these open forums to tell us what was going on. Mm -hmm. I was always one of the first people to raise my hands, as you probably remember, cause I was very curious about That's how good. this was going to affect everyone. Uh, and mm -hmm. you guys were always very forthright about what was happening and this was a real challenge mm -hmm. and how we were going to deal with, you know, the, the looming idea of bankruptcy. Uh, mm -hmm. and because this is obviously happens to a lot of visual effects company. Yeah. I got to say the fact that we went through that entire transition and not a single paycheck got skipped. <laughs> is incredible <laughs> and it is a testament to the leadership that was happening at that time um, because that was not it just wouldn't seem possible that we could do that and we did um, how was it for you from your side i mean obviously it's long gone that's the story's past and everything yeah. everyone's moved on and everyone's in a, in a great shape right now but that must have been a real challenge for you as a, as you know someone from you know from business and from uh, from management point of view. Mm -hmm. How how did you deal with that? It's it's a great question, and it's you know looking back now, gosh, seven and a half years later, there's still um, there's still lessons that I learned then about transparency and information share in the face of uncertainty mm -hmm. that I've reflected on a lot in the last 90 days. Um, you know, when the team of people at DD and the team in Florida as well, facing mm -hmm. uncertainty about bankruptcy and job loss and the impact that that has on someone's livelihood and their home and ability to pay rent. Right. Um, that's real and brings together a team of people in a way that few other things do, you know, and this, this recent crisis and yeah. health on top of that and wide economic um, impact. It, it, the, the common word there though, I think is uncertainty and more than ever being able to share the information that you do have, um, being able to be quite clear about what you don't know and not mm -hmm. trying to pretend to have all of those answers. You know, I'm sure that during that time, you and others asked questions and we had less answers, um, certainly than there were questions, but the entire team working together at that point in time was one, to share as much as humanly possible, two, to protect as many jobs as possible, in the service of being able to continue to deliver the projects we had and deliver for our customers on the commitments we made so that we would make it to the other side and be able to win more work and continue on and that DD, albeit in a different incarnation, would exist when we got to the other side. And when you're that aligned on goals and they're so clear at every single level, it really does bring people together. Um, so whatever the hours are, um, 
when you're that aligned, in a way, it simplifies things. The noise really, really drops away. Um, yeah. And it, it, it's all about taking care of those priorities. And there's nothing else left. Yeah. And I think there's a thing specifically, you know, transparency, as, as you mentioned, is so important, right? Because mm -hmm. you may not know. And sometimes that's not necessarily something that you need, you want to communicate, but sometimes it mm -hmm. is to sell. It's like, I don't mm -hmm. know, and we don't know, but we're going to come out this together because then the team that's behind there, behind you is going to trust you and say, okay, well, mm -hmm. we'll do what we can, you know, to do what we can to preserve what we can. And so that was, uh, the transparency was an incredibly, uh, um, um, uh, refreshing to be honest because that doesn't always happen <laughs> uh some people are like no no everything's gonna be okay and then suddenly like the rug gets pulled out from under you and that's yeah, just not it's fair a surprise. yeah so no it's hard. people need information you know and i think in any situation whether it's a crisis situation facing a bankruptcy um someone even interviewing for another job they need information to make decisions. And it's my job to help provide that information. Um, and in the case uh, where we were at DD, if that meant the information to take another opportunity elsewhere to preserve their livelihood and a paycheck, mm -hmm. they needed the information to be able to do that. And, you know, I found in my career supporting people by giving them the information to make the decisions they need to make for themselves long term, it's always paid off. Um, and withholding that information, I've never seen it happen that way. So, yes, it was it was an intense time, and I was very um, would never wish that on anyone, um, any <laughs> organization to yeah. go to go through that. Um, but to come out the other side um, with people that genuinely tried to work towards the same goal in the best way they knew possible, um, I think was the best outcome we could hope for. Right. Absolutely. And I'm sure, I mean, we're going to jump back and forth a little bit, but I'm sure yeah. that obviously from that, from that period, like you, like you were mentioning, it's like, you must've learned so much how to deal with crisis in some ways mm -hmm. that, um, that in a situation and it's an unknown, right? Like, for example, like you said, in the last 90 days, something no one would have anticipated if, if you yeah. told them, you know, six months ago has happened and completely disrupted the entire econ economic system and social mm -hmm. situation of the entire planet. Somehow, yeah. <laughs> we need to figure out how to adapt to this new world. How did you think what happened to you? Like you said, what happened in, you know during that that time of crisis at DD mm -hmm. has given you tools to help you deal with uh, it today. And what yeah. have you been able to use? Mm -hmm. I think the. Um... What I learned during that time at DD about how uncertainty would impact different people in different ways, I think has been extremely valuable. You know, I think the complexity of what we're all experiencing now, you know, as I said, both at a um, a public health crisis standpoint and a global economic crisis all at the same time, but then different groups of people experiencing that differently and at different times, depending on where you are in the world, what part of the industry you're in. Um, there's there's a lot to that. And I think, um, you know, over the past few months, you know, first and foremost, you, you again, you focus on the health and safety of your team. There's nothing more important than that, because at the end of the day, if they aren't taken care of, you know, at a human level, number one, nothing works. And two, um, we certainly can't be there to support our customers, support their transitions and what they're going through over that period of time. So right. I think it's um, being respectful and empathetic where any one person is on a given day, because there's good days and there's bad right now, you know, and while we see some customers and, you know, we've watched our team in APAC actually start to come out of the other side and see, um, you know, green shoots of recovery. There's mm -hmm. there's other team members and other customers that are actually entering into the most uncertain time, you mm -hmm. know, uncertain at a personal level, uncertain if jobs are going to be there yeah. um, and when the work's going to run out. So it's a bit of a roller coaster in that way. And I think remaining centered on those priorities and again, information share um, because nobody knows right now. Right. Um, and, you know, gaining, uh, gaining new information and applying that and refining that 
refining our path forward, I think more more important than ever, you know, and being being willing to make decisions and work towards a particular direction without having all the information because no one has it right now. No, they don't. Uh, but it's got to be, uh, there's got to be a, it's got to be challenging uh, mm -hmm. because you have to adapt very quickly. You know, people, Absolutely. you know, a lot of technology companies suddenly had changed their policies about certain things in a matter mm -hmm. of days. <laughs> and that's yeah. challenging to, to, to put that into practice. You can say something, you know, and say, mm -hmm. this is what we're going to do, but actually doing yeah. it is a lot more work than, than that. I mean, that must have yeah. been a real challenge for your team, right? It, it was. And I think, um, you know, interesting being a UK based company going mm -hmm. through the whole process we went through actually for GDPR a few years ago right. um, and the focus on data and privacy uh, actually was great training ground from a um, policy standpoint, infrastructure standpoint, all of that bar that we had to meet there. And of course, since then, you know, we've had Act in California with consumer privacy, et cetera. But right. it actually raised the bar in a really healthy way for the organization. I think, you know, huh. for us at Foundry, the challenge that we weren't ready to go fully remote for, um, that we really spent those last, I would say, the last four weeks before I made the decision to close the remaining four offices. Mm -hmm. It was, it, as you would expect, it's the performance workstations the teams are dependent on, you know, mm -hmm. not unlike you guys when you're doing builds across three OSs, yep. how you support that in a fully remote environment um, is a challenge. And that's really, you know, gosh, the unsung heroes, the folks in IT and DevOps that never get credit for anything. It's when they yeah. really shine working with the engineering team to pull it off. So, you know, relatively quickly, once I made the decision, um, to shut down the offices, the teams were able to test and we're getting builds out the door. You know, it's not perfect, certainly. Um, and it's not running at a hundred percent, but they are, they are making it work. Yeah, it's true. I mean, when you ask that to, you know, you know, in the middle of developing a new version or doing beta testing or whatever yeah. you're doing, and then like suddenly, you know, you're asking your IT person to basically change the tires on your car while it's still moving. And that's, you know, and moving really, fast. And, and I don't moving want to fast. Slow down. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah, it's a real challenge. Uh, and I don't know, you know, how, how people respond to that, but it's, it's real, it's really tough. Uh, um, and I think they're right. I think that they're, you know, uh, that there are a lot of people out there that need to be, to be, uh, uh, credited for the, or, or at least, mm -hmm. you know, celebrated for the work they're doing. Uh, because, you know, while, you know, there is obviously a lot of people in the healthcare industry need to be celebrated for the work they're doing, but there are people in the IT mm -hmm. department that are keeping people's jobs <laughs> just by Absolutely. being able to make that happen. And those people need to be, you know, they're, they're part of the economic solution that's going on right now. Uh, and, and also keeping us safe. And, uh, and that's really, you're, you're absolutely right that we should be celebrating those people. <laughs> Yeah, they've enabled this flexibility that is keeping so many people working, um, right. you know, that with without their expertise and getting this set up, um, we wouldn't be. So there's a lot of people um, besides everyone, of course, on the front lines that are keeping us, you know, up and running right now. So overall, I think, again, when the priorities are so clear and so much of the other noise drops away and it is about um coming together and supporting our customers and helping them get remote and get set up via vpn or a different license or whatever it takes to work in this newly flexible environment um being able to do that but there's something really powerful about that focus as well um, and i think the way that people are willing to give each other the benefit of the doubt and come together as a team it's been really impressive but do you think that, I mean, there's a, a friend of mine who, who doesn't like to drive, but decides he's mm. going to take the train from Duarte to Santa Monica. It's two and a half hours each way every day. So it's five hours on the train that he does. And suddenly now he's working from home and he goes, oh my God, I just saved myself five hours of uh, commuting that I don't have to do anymore. And he goes, yeah. I don't know why I would ever go back to work. Why can I just do this that. Yeah. from all the time? So do you think that in the end, while this has been very tough, everything else, we are going to learn mm -hmm. a new way of working that may actually be better <laughs> in some, yeah, for some people? I, I think your, I think your friend is on to something there. I think 
what we've learned in these forced experiments, if you will, um, about ways of working, about how to be most effective as a team, whether that's a development team, whether that's a product team trying to do discovery um, or a marketing team running a digital event. And in fact, they're actually reaching 4,000 people instead of 400 mm -hmm. um, because of the way they approached it. <laughs> yep. There have been a ton of learnings already to come out of this. Right. Um, you know, even as simple as how we run a meeting with a distributed team. You know, I had someone tell me the other day who's always actually a remote worker and said, you know, for the first time, I really feel like I'm part of the team because it's a level playing field. I'm not the odd man out anymore. Um, right. And the way that we're having to work together changed the dynamic. And I thought, you know, how what an interesting insight into how we can change even how we run a meeting to make um, create greater opportunity for everyone's voices to be heard. So, yes, I do. I think, you know, in the short term, there's learnings I know we're already applying both internally and how we interact with our customers. Um, mm -hmm. And long term, I think as we all um, gain more clarity on what this means for long term changes in the industry, how we engage with each other, um, I, I do think there will be more. And I think they'll they'll continue to be revealed over the next three, six, nine months. Yeah. Yeah. And it's funny because there's things that have happened that people say would never happen. And because they're forced to happen, they did happen. And then we proved them wrong. It's like, we'll never be able to work from home because we're working on all these very yeah. secret movies. Like, well, guess what? If you have no choice, then you are. <laughs> and you found a solution mm -hmm. somehow. <laughs> and so, and then suddenly like, oh, that's okay. That's possible. Um, and I think it's interesting to think about uh, the idea of remote work because not everyone is going to have the kind of work that was done in visual effects or the kind of work that you need yeah. for using Nuke or, or, or Katana or whatever, it's going to require high-end computers, right? It's going to require mm -hmm. a lot of a lot of power to do that. And if you're working from home, you don't necessarily have that ability to you know, have a $10,000 or $20,000 box yeah. sitting at your desk. So remote mm -hmm. work is going to become interesting, remote working into that, that idea. And cloud has become, obviously, we've been dealing with cloud at Chaos Group for a while, but just the idea of understanding how people can interact uh, on the cloud uh, is fascinating. I mean, is this something that you guys have been, I'm sure this is something you guys have been exploring for, for a while. It has. And even, you know, for, for a period of time there, we had our team um, focused on Ethereum and specifically a full cloud platform end to end and made the decision last fall um, to actually pivot away from a commercial offering. You know, we found in the market that it was too early and really where our customers were at then and where we continue to see for the for the near term, at least, is it's more of a hybrid environment, you know. Mm -hmm. Rare is the case where it's a production that it's a true cloud environment, everything from workstations to your license servers to storage render processing databases to make it work and so that while there were people that successfully delivered um, visual effects that way um, that wasn't the first step um, however a lot of those learnings and even you know over the last three or four months as we've seen studios go to this remote um, setup largely through remote workstation, through VPNing in, simplest right. solution, of course, because all of their infrastructure already exists. Mm -hmm. um, I do think, to your point about performance workstations and people thinking differently about that next round of capital investment, what about virtual workstations? You know, Because right. it is, you are paying as you go on that. If you know right. what kind of, um, what kind of spec you need to do that type of work, how important is it to have that anymore? You know, and as people, you know, go into this next cycle of investment, how do they change where they really invest? You know, is it important to have just core infrastructure and mm -hmm. everything else is elastic on top of that? Um, you know, at the end of the day, if you figure out how to move the data around, does it really matter? You know, I think right. if you asked most of our customers right now, if there was one thing they could have changed going into it, most of them would tell you they'd wish they had a bitter pipe into their studio to move the data back and forth because yep. everyone is remote. <laughs> yeah. It's surprised. I, I mean, we were joking. It was like, I'm surprised the internet hasn't broken, but it's proven. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because it's proven. I was like, wow. 
You know, I'm also really glad about uh, six months ago, I ended up getting fiber from my house. It's like, I'm just going to go ahead and get fiber. And I'm like, I'm so glad. Wise I decision. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So Very glad wise decision. Yeah. So uh, I'm, I'm really had it. Well, for, you know, I'm glad I have it now, but it is interesting, right? Because then it becomes, then you're, it, it's the idea was, you know, you, you may remember back in, in the early 2000s, the idea was that you're no, having a big computer is not going to be as important as having a fast internet connection, right? Exactly. And a fast internet. Exactly. You know, yeah. So if you can use a Chromebook and do everything on the cloud remotely, mm -hmm. then it's fine. Then it just comes down to having a nice keyboard and a nice monitor and the rest is, exactly. is all remote. Uh, and I think that's interesting because, um, you know, tools like Nuke are, uh, are critical. I mean, I, I, I that the first time I learned to do compositing, I knew a little bit of After Effects uh, before that. But the first time I really sat with a real compositor was at Digital Domain with Nuke before mm -hmm. it was a product <laughs> that came out. Yeah. And I was sat there and it was just a blank gray screen and you had nothing. You had one node in the middle that said viewer. I'm like, how do I even start? And it mm -hmm. was and it was fascinating to me. It's like it suddenly explained how you build and you build and it it became so liberating to think about that tool as uh because it really is so complicated but it starts with nothing and you just build mm -hmm. this this mesh of ideas as you go through it's like a brain map so when i saw like node-based compositing that was my first experience in it in nuke and i was like this is really amazing what it can do but it can be some of the most simple thing possible to the most incredible comps I've ever seen and mm -hmm. learning from uh, compositors and all of those things is such an important role to play. Uh, do you see tools like, like uh, that you guys are offering obviously as very big in the visual effects world, uh, but do you see them have a bigger role in the overall computer graphic world that is going to uh, affect more than, than visual effects and other things? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And actually, you know, following a bit of the people and some of the products, we've actually spent um, a meaningful amount of time in design lately, particularly with the Moto team. Um, mm. You know, and that was always part of that business, going all the way back to Luxology. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, not unlike Chaos Group, outside of visual effects and animation, you know, mm -hmm. I'm sure there's some overlap in customers there. But particularly right now, this drive towards digital product creation and what that means in footwear, accessories, consumer right. packaged goods, now more than ever, right. um, it, there's an interest. You know, there already was, you know, and you'd see in our case studies looking on our website work that we'd done um, with New Balance and others in this space. But I think the demand for that, particularly given what we've experienced, is only going to continue to increase. You know, all of these big brands around the world have had, you know, innovation agendas for a number of years now, you know, working at different rates. Um, you know, they're the same people that we would see attend Seagraph because mm -hmm. they will participate in the wider CG space, but, you know, not necessarily um, visual effects and animation per se. But many of those people in those organizations, this is their background. You know, they came from worlds where pipeline was important. The ability right. to translate data across applications was important. Right. Um, the ability to maintain um, quality of visualization throughout a process was important to them. And all of these things are equally applicable uh, in enterprise design. So, um, yeah, the design team with Moto and Colorway spend quite a lot of time there. Um, yeah, and it's, it's actually interesting to see the overlap um, both in people and product and, and process to some extent. Yeah, I find it fascinating. I remember, you know, I was, you know, we obviously have uh, a lot of similar customers in different areas. And I remember st talking specifically to a customer, they were talking about uh, using Katana in the automotive design world. And I'm mm. like, why mm -hmm. would you use Katana? And it just didn't make any sense because I always had this vision of what Katana is for, like, or what it was yeah. designed for. And then suddenly I was like, oh, no, I need it because I need to create all these different configurations of a car of every single possibility. It's like, oh, yeah, Katana's perfect for that. Ex <laughs> I just exactly. didn't even think about it. You know? Yeah, when you distill it down to what could a rules-based workflow do? 
that was non-destructive right. when right. It, rather than starting from a place of lighting and looked at um, right. yeah the application um is certainly interesting there um and and we do we do have customers um in those adjacent spaces to us um not a huge focus for us with katana but we definitely have interest and do have customers in that space yeah, I think it's interesting just to think about like mm -hmm. how that, what that, what that means and how that works. Yeah. Uh, so let's, I, I, we kind of skipped a little bit forward, but I want to go back a little bit about Foundry and how Foundry, yeah. you know, started and, and, and uh, I mean, obviously you've been the, uh, the you're the, the new CEO now you've been there, which is great, which is congratulations. Mm -hmm. I haven't said that but before, you. but <laughs> very, very excited about that happening. Uh, but l give us a little bit of a background about the Foundry and how, how that company started and, you know, what, what led it to be the company it is today? Yes. Um, well, Foundry uh, founded in 1996 uh, mm -hmm. by Bruno Nicoletti and then Simon Robinson, our co-founder, who's actually still with us today, mm -hmm. um, and started as a plug-in company. Uh, I was actually a customer of Foundry buying plugins for yep. the Sabre group at ILM back in 2000. Yes. Um, so when the big, the big Inferno systems um, back in the day, so it, it really really focused on plugins for those early years mm -hmm. um, on into early 2000. Um, I actually, when I moved to Digital Domain in 2007, my first office there was actually the D2 software office, mm -hmm. um, which is really where Foundry um, as part of DED and Nuke came together. And I guess it was 2008, um, ownership had changed a few times, company had grown, Foundry was actually part of DD, and then there was a management buyout around that time. And okay. at that point, Foundry separated um, Nuke and D2 Software out right. from Digital Domain, um, Foundry, and right. and and really then taken over. Um, of course, Jonathan Eggstat, Bill Spitzkat, was the original authors working right. very closely with the team then in London boundary. So that's when the separation really started. So yeah, 2007, 2008, um, right. that same time period. And, you know, Nuke, of course, flagship product. Um, and then beyond that. Um, but that was a very was important early... product, a very important product, because there, that was the only, that was the only real s solution that was emerging at that time, right? Exactly. It was the end of Shake. There yep. wasn't another <laughs> yeah. commercial solution out there. You know, various um, companies had their own internal compositors. But yes, this was um, th this was the next big thing. And in many ways, I think everyone believed that by removing it from one house, it was going to give it new life with Foundry, you know, mm -hmm. and then the opportunity to accelerate development, make it a commercial product with support with the commercial software company. That was the critical step um, in ensuring ensuring its ongoing growth and adoption across the industry. Right. And that was a big deal, a big deal. And then uh, Foundry continued to to uh, get the new software from that point, right? So like Katana and then what was the other one I'm thinking of? That's uh, right. Katana and Flix from Sony. Yeah. And then uh, Mari, texture Mari, cleaning from yeah. Weta from Weta, right? So basically it seemed that there were some of these big studios who were kind of eager to pass on some of their proprietary software to the foundry. What was the, what do you think the motivation on was there? It's like, we don't want to develop this anymore because we might as well just give it back to the community. Was it that, or was it just too much work? I, pro probably a combination of all of the above. And, okay. you know, getting, getting software through the transition of an internal product and what is used for all of the use cases, even in a studio that has film, commercial products, um, animation, and visual effects, to be a viable commercial product, it's a lot of work and a lot of support. Um, and you know, and those were even before the days where we were trying to, you know, standardize on reference platform every year, every other year. Um, it and if that is not your core business balancing the priorities of an internal studio and anyone else external, that's really hard to do. Right. Um, you know, in some ways, they're competition, perhaps, for the same type of work, depending on on who you are in that ecosystem. Um, so I think the opportunity to not only have someone else take on that IP, 
continuing developing it, even if they want to continue developing it right. internally. Um, it also helps seed the larger industry with talent that becomes um, trained on that product, which, as we all know, um, at the end of the day, if you don't have artists trained on your products, um, that's really going to limit how flexible you can be, um, both in the work you can take on, your ability um, to, to give artists the opportunity to move between projects and facilities. So that knowledge base in the industry is really important. Um, and I think moving it outside, moving that IP out of house, um, the talent component is just as important as the long term engineering and support. Yes. Um, but I got to say, the transition of Nuke from the in house software that was Nuke, where all I had was a gray slate and a dot, and I had no idea where to go from there to becoming the product that is today, where you, there's got to be a transition where, you know, I don't have a, 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 mm -hmm. an artist who wants to learn Nuke doesn't have the, 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 the the gift that I have where I can just go to Jonathan Eggstap and ask him like, how do I make yeah. this work? Right. <laughs> Cause that's what it was like yeah. at Didi. He invented Nuke and he exactly. told me how to make it work. I, someone doesn't yeah. have that ability. So you have to create a whole new interface, a whole new way of thinking, mm -hmm. a whole new way of adapting this specific in-house software to be more commonplace for people to learn and use. And that's got how, I mean, that's gotta be a transition. That's gonna be tough, right? Absolutely, because you're you're transitioning from, um, you know, even in the case of DD, the type of work we were known for, the type of work that was done in house that Nuke was fine tuned for. Once you um, move out of that and have different use cases, um, you, what you're trying to accommodate, both in flexibility of workflow, user interface, as you already said, uh, performance. Mm -hmm. support on all OSs, um, th the wider that market is that you're trying to serve, um, it definitely introduces new challenges. Equally, I think the refinements that come with that kind of focus on UI, interop with other products, even now with standards, um, I think they benefit all users um, from that perspective. And I think, you know, our approach has always been and continues to be we serve customers where the ability to pick and choose what products are you're going to be in your pipeline is extremely valuable. Um, right. And so that that flexibility um, to work well with other products that are common in our industry um, and people that we all partner with, that's really important. And I think becomes of utmost importance when you take a product out of house um, as, as we did with Nuke. Yeah, I think it was, uh, I mean, it was definitely, you saw the transition, right? And you saw some mm -hmm. of, I, I remember being a DD, people were like, oh, this doesn't look like Nuke. And it's like, well, it's not, <laughs> oh, you know, and it's like, well, you can't just give someone a blank slate and a gray dot and say, good luck, you know, <laughs> you yeah. have to give them something that works right. So it's a very different world. And I, it's funny because what I love is that I can actually, in Nuke, I should actually change it to be just exactly what i just said but exactly and, and so that's an interface that i can still appreciate uh but uh but I, it is a it is really you know powerful tool obviously with with things like mari and things like a katana and and moto uh, and all the products that you guys uh uh do you're definitely the the high end of of visual effects mm -hmm. in terms of that work right you guys have really focused on that and, and the, on those customers and those customers needs. So it's pretty impressive uh, what's been going on uh, during that time. So you started off as part of uh, operations at the foundry. Is that correct? That's right. It, um, though it wasn't, it wasn't intentional. It was supposed <laughs> to be for a week long stay. Really? Um, I, yeah. It, yeah. <laughs> actually two days. Um, yeah. When, when Bill Collis and, and Simon, our co-founder, Bill was our CEO at the time called and said, um, you know, we know we need some help. Why don't you just come over to London for a few days to help out and just meet the team? Um, because I had ever actually been over to London to visit, you know, in right. the time that Foundry separated from DD um, and I was at DD for those next five years, a number right. of those with you, um, you know, we kept in touch. They would come by the office. Of course, yep. we were a customer at DD then, but we were a customer again. Right. So um, at any rate, I, I agreed to go over to London and visit for a few days. And 
really it was getting to spend time with the team that I realized how much one I missed the industry but specifically missed te technology mm -hmm. um you know and in my roles at DD they transitioned away from pure technology roles focused on software and hardware and systems to roles focused on artist management and right. studio management yep. um and while I loved them and it was great to see the picture, I remembered everything I loved about technology in those few days in London. And mm. so when they said, well, why don't you stay for a while? And I said, well, you know, actually I live in Austin now, not in London. <laughs> they said, oh, I'll just come back for a month. So I went back for a month and uh -huh. a month led to six months, which led to a COO job again. Um, and then that, you know, few years passed, um, agreed to stay on, moved through various roles in products and customer. Um, and, and frankly, similar to my roles at DD and even prior to that, ILM and Lucasfilm, largely jobs born out of business need for the work we were trying to do with the company at that time. And it actually wasn't until stepping into the CEO role uh, this past summer that I realized I hadn't actually stepped into a job that existed before I had it since my first role. So right. a bit, a bit full circle 20 years later. Huh. Yeah. That's interesting. Okay. So you say you live in Austin, right? So now, mm -hmm. so you still live in Austin and that's great. Love Austin. I still East. live in Austin. Yeah. Longest stretch. I've been home in seven years here. Right. <laughs> that's great. Uh, what led you to Austin? You know, it was, uh, when I left DD, gosh, that was the end of 2012 post bankruptcy, yeah. new team was set up. Um, knew I wanted a break, um, wasn't sure what I was going to do next. Um, and actually coming to Austin to visit friends, it had that creative talent and technology that I really liked about the Bay Area 20 years prior, mm -hmm. um, but was small and it was, it had a very small town feel, um, similar to where I grew up. Um, but it still had all of that potential and yeah. because I wasn't sure what was going to be next, it seemed like there's going to be something here. Um, and that was it. So moved, um, moved without a job and, uh, was enjoying that break, uh, when Bill and Simon called from Foundry wow. and then seven years passed and here we are. Well, I love Been commuting Austin. ever since. <laughs> it's, I love it's Austin. Good. Yeah, I used. To, I mean, I used to live in Houston for a long time, so I used to go to Austin, mm -hmm. and uh, it's, it's great. Obviously, you know, there's a lot of creative stuff going on there. It's a pretty town. Weird, weird things like you know the the Bat Bridge, <laughs> like all of that <laughs> stuff. <laughs> and I love yeah. that, you know. Uh, which is, by the way, if they, people don't know, there's a bridge uh, in Austin that houses, I think, about five million bats that are, live underneath the bridge. Yeah. And then if uh, when the sun sets, they all come out at once, and it's the most beautiful particle system you'll ever see. <laughs> it's just this it is cloud gorgeous. of bats that comes out. It's really pretty to see that. But uh, since you've Stay, you know, live in Austin, uh, and you're mm -hmm. you're working for a uh, uh, you know a company in London, and you're the CEO. You seem to have figured out remote working pretty well. I'm sure at this point, <laughs> right? I think I think I'd have given you a different answer depending on the week before all of this, but right. I do um, because we have such a distributed team and a distributed customer base. You know, there's almost 300 of us. You yeah. know, we have. There's a London office, Manchester. There's about 20 people in the Austin office here yeah. um, in support and sales, small team in Sydney, of course, the team in APAC. Um, and then our customers are distributed. So between time in London, time on the road, seeing customers, the home base, I think particularly over the last three years or so, has become less relevant, um, to be perfectly honest. I think right. it would have been more difficult had I still been on the West Coast. I mean, I think what you do covering 10 hours, That's 10 I don't hours think I could do that. No. Not enough overlap where yeah. central time zone, six hours with London, great amount of time with the West Coast, right. overlap with Australia, um, APAC is needed in the evening. It's actually central time zone. I think it's, it's no mistake. A lot of companies have their America's operations here because it's pretty nice coverage. Right. It's true. Uh, my day starts 
you know, about six o'clock in the morning when my alarm goes off and I have 15 emails or 20 emails that I have to answer right away. So it's a little tough. And then you have to do it all by yeah. like 10 o'clock. Otherwise, you're not going to get an answer to the next day. That is a little tough, uh, but it's still manageable. Exactly. It's still manageable. You can work with it. Uh, that is the hardest part of remote working is time zones, right? Mm -hmm. But it's also very liberating, you know, and the same thing like this, you know, one of the things about this podcast, I always wanted to do them in person, as, as I've mentioned before, and that's why I was waiting for you to come to L.A. at some point. That's changed our situation. Uh, and then suddenly I said, well, we're going to have to find a solution. So I found these uh, this remote podcast system and suddenly I'm so many more uh, people are coming out and saying, yeah, sure, I'll do that. Yeah, uh, I just got an email from uh, or been communicating with uh, Andy Lomas. Um, uh, oh, that's great. And because uh, he's done some amazing research uh, in deep learning and aesthetics. And I saw his paper about that. I was like, well, well yeah, let's just do a podcast. Great artwork. Too. Yeah. So let's do a yeah. podcast with him. Uh, and, uh, and he's like, great. I'm in London. It's like, so we'll work it out with the time zones and it's fine. Uh, so it's, it is, if you're, become, if you, if you're willing to become a little more flexible, you can actually reach out to a whole lot more people. Uh, but it is, it you is, can. yeah. You're right though. Central time zone. It, that's pretty good. <laughs> no, it's, it, it's a pretty good setup. I think, um, you know, the way the team has been flexible, not just this, but I think the interest across the team also in getting out into the market with our customers and not just product people and sales, but developers, product designers um, over the past few years. I think one of the things, one of the learnings from being at DD and before that in the Bay Area, you know, when, when people weren't connecting or able to problem solve quickly, there was always something so powerful about having a developer go sit next to an artist that was mm. using their product, you know, and I remember Craig or Doug would have someone do that at DD. And it was like, well, get out of your desk, walk over and find out what's going on. Yeah. And what you can learn by sitting next to someone for even an hour without even talking or asking questions, just observing them use the product that you're working on and the challenges that they hit. It's so valuable. Right. Um, and I think, you know, when I think about how I would replace some of that engagement right now. Those are some of the things I've been considering because I do think for product designers or engineering teams, that access to customers, it's so important. Right. Um, it's really important. And I think not having that opportunity um, is, is, is tough um, over long term. You know, I think yeah. while we can all be great on Zoom and on video um, and we're better connected than ever, you know, how do we find ways to fill in the gaps that would have otherwise been 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 uh, filled by in-person interaction and communication? Yeah, it's true. It's true. Um, what do you think, uh, you know, what are some of the things that you believe are going to be the future of, of what we're doing in terms of, you know, the technology and the stuff in, in, you know, specifically in the visual effects world, because I think that's something that you guys are so, play such an important part in. Do you think there's going to be some new ideas and new paradigm shifts that are happening in, in the next few years. Obviously we, everything's changed now. So we don't really, there's a lot of questions we don't know the answer yeah. to, but do you think that there's going to be some ideas of what technology is going to become in the next, you know, five years or so? I think the, I think the overall focus of the industry on um, both efficiency at scale um, because the demand for content, even through this, continues to be high and will continue to be. Um, and what that means for people in visual effects and animation um, as it relates to performance, as it relates to freeing up artists' time more and more through um, more innovative workflows, um, not necessarily full automation, but um, everything that machine learning can bring us in tools to make artists more efficient. Mm. Um, I think all of those things continue to become more important. You know, when I think about uh, the longer term horizon and enabling technologies like machine learning, where our research team has been spending some time um, and is doing more work, you know, beyond the open source server they released, but getting that actually into nodes and products so that it's useful for artists. Um, real time as part of workflows, um, not just as a technology in and of itself, but 
from a standpoint of accelerating decision making and mm-hmm. where does that live in traditional workflows and change it and how does that change pipelines long term um, and then of course back to um, this remote working and focus on how to accelerate for our customers greater flexibility in hybrid environments you know what does that mean for data what does that mean for having a distributed pipeline and teams of people um, and how do we ensure our existing products now and next generation products um, are prepared to not just survive in that environment, but actually make artists um, even more able to spend time doing what they want to do, you know, and that's on creative process, not on repetitive work. So I think those those three themes overarching, you know, our own strategic plan um, and where our initiatives were for 2020 and continue to be. I don't see those changing. Um, and in fact, you know, as I reflect on the things that, you know, when I kicked off the planning process with the team last September after stepping into this role, you know, everything that we talked about that was important in three, five years and beyond, um, if anything, what has happened over the last three or four months has only solidified the yeah. importance of all of those things and that longer term investment, you know, beyond what's on the roadmap for this year. But how do we ensure that we're well placed to support our customer base um, long term in that way? So, definitely more on that soon. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm. I am. I'm find it a little bit ironic that obviously you know, and sad that you know a lot of productions, a lot of work has stopped, and people have had a hard time dealing with that. But at the same time, the demand for content has skyrocketed because people are stuck uh-huh. at home, you know, and so suddenly there is this huge demand for content. Um, and the world has to adapt to what kind of content they're consuming or what that world is like. Uh, I've mm-hmm. been sitting here thinking, it's like, you know, this, this could very well be a, a very disruptive, uh, uh, something that was, I believe was inevitable in terms of the film industry, right? And the inevitability that mm-hmm. traditional filmmaking movie theater experiences are going to be disrupted heavily by this but at the same time the demand for people to see high quality content is still very very high and Mm -hmm. uh the the world of streaming is obviously going to change a lot uh what that what that that new landscape is going to look like and the kinds of content that people expect uh do you obviously do you think that you know what the world of streaming is does that does that change how you view the technology you're working on you know going from traditional film stuff to like more of a streaming and online world do you think that that changes the way technology adapts itself um perhaps for us less so because we're a bit one step removed i think it's the overall demand and increase for content okay that's driving this need for efficiency, the ability to move data, not just within, you know, single, um, single studios, but multiple studios, the ability to do that efficiently at scale, um, the need for um, consistency of visualization from start to finish at the earliest stages of pre through virtual production, if you will, through mm-hmm. delivery, um, the challenges of data and carrying data through pipelines end to end. Those things, whether the content is viewed in your living room um, or in a car on an iPad (laughs) or in the movie theater, less important, I think, for us in that way. Interesting. Um, I think, of course, you know, in the near term, you know, as we talk to so many of our customers, you know, it's, it's a bit of a mix of impact with, you know, of course, many in animation still busy and working, albeit remotely. Right. Um, others, of course, doing post work have enough to keep them going for a period of time. Until some, the next few batch months, at, Some right. longer, some shorter. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Um, so I think what, what happens in, you know, this quarter and into Q3, probably greater unknown, you know, as we start to see things perhaps recover more in Q, Q4. But I think that big question about, live action production you know and we i think we've all been hearing about some of the projects moving entirely to animation while they figure out what that looks like in the future yeah that's the big question mark for me you know i think it's fascinating what does live action look like yeah i mean i remember the time when the 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 writer's strike happened right and all of a sudden they came up with this new idea called a reality show (laughs) to try 
right? And then all of a sudden, the reality show, we thought it was just going to be there to, you know, to stave off the entertainment industry while they, but it's, it stuck around. And so I have this feeling that animation uh, is going to be a new medium that's going to emerge. Not new; It's not a new medium, obviously, but it's going to become more important uh, as people decide, well, we're just going to continue work with animation in to some case. I don't think live action is going away uh, or will go away, yeah. but uh, I think animation is going to have an important role in, in, in our future. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, I completely agree. So it's, um, it's certainly what comes out of this and the inventiveness that I think we're already seeing from a number of our customers. Um, yeah, really, really impressive. I think even just from a creative standpoint and rethinking what their approaches were to some of these projects. So um, lot, lots of learning to be done. Yeah. Yes. Well, I think we, we I think it's amazing. I think it's really uh, cool that, you know, that, that, while we're, we're struggling to figure out uh, how to deal with the situation, but I think that we're going to come up with some very interesting ideas. And I really, you know, I'm glad to have, you know, companies like your company and my company is like, well, let's figure out what we can do to make these customers happy and to be able to continue to make great content because there is a demand for this stuff. Uh, and there's a demand for, 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 for high quality work. Um, and the fact that we can enable our, uh, both our customers to work uh, from home is also a big, a big deal for us. So. Thank you for it doing really that. <laughs> no, you, no, I was, no, and I saw your response and I, and I also, of course, love the picture of Vlado's dog on the website. <laughs> um, it just, it, the way the industry has come together, I think, number one, the resilience, um, and two, just the willingness to try to work together to make this all work for however long it lasts um, and to be flexible with each other. And whether that's supporting students at home right now that are yep. outside of school and want to learn, learn and work on our products and the skill up events that, you know, a number of us I know are holding um, to supporting the commercial work that continues on with everyone remote. Um, it's just, it's, it's so important because it does take everyone working together to get to the other side of this. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, in, in the silver linings group, I think that to me, day to day through all of the challenges that we're facing is the best, the best part. Absolutely. I know my, my wife's a, a flame artist and, uh, so she's, uh, she's home right now. Unfortunately, her flame is locked up in the building and she says, well, I think it's a good time for me to brush up on my nuke skills. So she's, uh, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> <laughs> so she's like, oh, so let's learn some nuke while I'm here. So I was like, great, we'll set you up with that. So, uh, and, exactly. and you, guys offer, you guys offer that ability. So like, you know, extend that time that you can try it. You can try it for much. Absolutely. Longer. So, so that really helpful. <laughs> no, it's good. It's really good. No, I think, um, what everyone, the amount of learning actually that's been happening while people are remote has been, um, so impressive to me, not just our products, but just in general, P people, the interest in picking up new skills and skills development during this time, mm -hmm. um, I think to mix up the time at home, it's just been really impressive to see. I love yep. that. Yep. I'm picking up uh, uh, tying flies. That's another thing I'm, <laughs> I'm picking up on my free time. <laughs> to go fly fishing? Yeah. <laughs> yes. I like yeah, that. Yeah, just something just- In from... LA? Really? Yes, actually, you get. Well, if you're from the Central Coast, actually, you can actually fly fish yeah. on, the, uh, on in the surf. It's actually one of the most challenging fly fishing I've ever done. But it's really, really? It, yeah. It's cold out there. It is. Yes, I was born in Lompoc. I know. I know that <laughs> neighborhood. And surf is cold. That is not. That is not a beach. Yeah, no, it's tough, but uh, there's there's some very interesting things down there, and there's a great community that I found online that helps you figure out what kind of materials to. And it's like. All of a sudden, this whole other world has appeared that would never have happened if I hadn't just like, Meh, I'm just going to pick that up. <laughs> so, so that's yeah. that's impressive. Yeah. That's really impressive. That's a good <laughs> that's good learnings right now. I think, um, yeah, any the the work that people have been doing, you know, besides the 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 crafting of models at home and the enormous amount of cooking that's been happening. Yep. Um, yeah, all the projects coming out of, of, of people's homes right now. It's pretty impressive to see. But that's the first time I've heard creating flies for fly fishing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's fun. It's fun. Well, thank you so much for, for doing this. This has been an amazing talk. And you're 
always great to hear from you. But you know, at some point, when when things do settle in and you're able to make it out to LA or I come to Austin, uh, I'll definitely want to stop by and see each other in person. That would be great. I would like that. No, I'm um, yeah. Well, I expected us to be doing this in LA around an NAB trip. Uh, I'm glad this worked out. It's yeah. really good to see you. Perfect. All right. Thank you so I much. I can't believe you're almost at 300 podcasts. It's impressive. I look forward to the 300. Well, thank you. Me too. I can't believe it either. Every time I say the number of the episodes, it, like what? <laughs> so yeah. It, you're going to get there faster than you think yeah. now that you're going to have people signed up from all over the world. Yeah, it's true. It's true. It's true. Well, thank you, Jody. 